right, well, everybody, first of all, um, we just had a phenomenal day of skiing. At least, at least I did, and if you didn't, I'm not sure what happened, um, but that was a heck of a day, and it was so fun to get to make some turns with a number of you, and we get three more days to do this, so I'm very happy about that. I hope it was a great day for you. I hope some of the things that we talked about yesterday in terms of how to review gear, um, I thought, I hope some of those points were helpful for some of you. Um, and now what we have is a panel session on ski design. Uh, and what we're going to do a bit of here, we actually have four folks who design and build skis. And we're going to have them talk a bit about their operations, where they build skis. And then we're going to start getting into some related topics, including what these folks look for in terms of evaluating how well a ski is made. So I don't know, hypothetical, let's say you're at a ski demo event and there's thousands of skis out there. To be able to go look at a ski and start evaluating or even wondering what you might be looking for to start getting a sense of, is this a well-constructed ski or not? Um, and we're gonna talk a bit about finishing process as well. Um, it's not something that gets talked about a whole lot and I thought, um, let's open up that topic and I think there can be some um, useful tips uh, in there from these folks. And then we will open it up to your own questions. So that is our agenda. And now, um, let's have these fine folks introduce themselves. Um, Janusz. That's right. Very happy to have you here. Yeah. Um, talk about where you build skis and talk a bit about the company. Uh, I'm from Majesty Skis Company. Uh, we build our skis in Poland, uh, at the south of Poland. And um, we started f 15 years ago uh, with um, two twin tips. Um, Back in the days, it was like freestyle model and um, free ride model. And at the beginning, like building ski that had a tip to tail wood core, that was innovation because we couldn't find skis that would be good for us. They were like racing skis, skis with plastic inside. So when the whole like free ski area has begun, we started building skis um, that were like truly wood core skis. And from, from that point, we started bringing more and more details to the product. Um, and um, by building skis, I would like say that we, what we do, we take one model and try to make it better each time. So it means that we don't make radical moves all the time, not to lose this like special moment when you can create extraordinary ski. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mike. Um, <clears throat> I'm Mike McCabe with Folsom Custom Skis. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Co-founder and CEO. Uh, actually been doing it for just over 15 years as well. Launched in 08. Um, as the name implies, Folsom Custom Skis, our bread and butter is building custom skis. So we actually do everything in-house in our private facility in Denver. And we make small, meaningful changes to our skis to make them work better for the end user. Um, we have also shared the same values of using tip to tail wood cores from day one and really just having the highest grade materials available and the highest grade finishes available, which we'll get to um, kind of all the way through. We've intentionally kept the business quite small and scaled it quite carefully over many years to maintain just the best product quality and really our biggest bottom line is our connection with our clients. We have really high level uh, communication all the way through um, from your first contact to the whole custom fit to actually getting your ski built and then the follow through. We really, really like to know, you know, how you're experiencing that product, if it's working well for you and how we can improve upon our, our systems. Um, now, 15 years in, we still are quite small. We're not building a ton of skis. We do just over a thousand skis a year, and we're super proud of everything that comes out of our doors. Ted. 
Hi, uh, Ted Einan with Meyer Skis based in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Meyer Skis was founded in 2009 by Matt Cudmore out in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Uh, I started it in a very small one car garage and uh, uh, Matt and I went skiing, had a few beers and, and decided to uh, work together and set up a production facility out in Glenwood uh, in 2012. Uh, decided we would move to Denver in 2016 and been there ever since. Uh, Meyer Skis, a uh, little unique in that we uh, manufacture uh, standard product skis, so a standard graphic, standard shapes. We also do semi-custom skis with different graphics that pre-exist, a library of hundreds of graphics and partnerships with artists and musicians and bands and so forth. And then we do full custom skis as well, uh, putting different graphics on uh, one of the 23 models that we have. Uh, we sell direct to consumer, and uh, we have an incredibly passionate following uh, across North America, a uh, little bit beyond, but mostly in North America. Um, and we, uh, we're, a little unique in that we use a clear top sheet. So everything we make has a distinct, distinctive look uh, where we show off the actual wood core to the skis. And it shows the different colors of the grains of the wood um, as well as the workmanship. And, you know, we use the highest quality materials throughout the skis and make them super fun to ski. And as, as both these guys have suggested, you know, that connection with your customer base and listening to them and refining your skis, your models, your materials as time goes on is, is critical. And, uh, you know, we, we do that well. We also have a kind of an immersive brand experience. You know, when we think of skiing, we think of fun. And so at our, uh, our global world headquarters in Denver, Colorado, we have uh, uh, a big retail area in there and a big bar behind the bar is all glass and you can hang out and have a beer and watch the crew actually laying up and pressing skis. We do happy hour tours there and just give people kind of more transparency to learn about the ski building process and what's involved in it. Because a lot of people, you know, you slap the skis on your feet and you go and you might like them, you might not. Um, but to know how much effort goes in, how much thought goes into making the skis, uh, for all of us that are up here on the panel, there's a lot to it. And uh, I think it's kind of eye-opening for folks to see that. So we, we enjoy that part of the business. It's kind of the fun side of the game. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much my skis. Hmm. Tumas. Yeah, it's like to be here. My name is Tumas Loxo. I'm VP of Product and Engineering at uh, DPS Skis. Uh, we have a great design team. I, I joke that beer yep yeah it was on purpose yeah. oh so oh you're just so nice they're free in the back here no. so um uh i play a uh, engineer or a designer on tv but um uh we have a really good engineering team and peter turner and stephen drake were the founders of the company um about 15 years ago and it's, and it's pretty interesting to see our, our, our date of birth is kind of similar here mm -hmm. it's there was a period in ski history where it was almost like a microbrewery period where, where um, there was a lot of excitement of, hey, man, those snowboards look pretty fun and let's do some dramatically different things in the ski industry because we can't buy those skis um, in, the, uh, in the industry. So I think that's a lot of our genesis was just wanting to do something different. Peter Turner um, had been working with Shane McConkey at Volant. He was designing skis there, and that was kind of the advent of real geometry exploration, um, looking at how skis go over a more of a fluid and what does a powder ski need to do. Um, and once I think a, um, Volant was sold, and and Shane went to K2, and and that's when. Um, Peter and Stefan formed DPS. Let's do something different. Let's not only do crazy hard shapes, let's build it the most difficult way with carbon fiber. And so that was kind of the um, birth of the company 15 years ago. And, and, and being here is a testament of how, I mean, it's hard work. Building skis, being here, there's a lot. I would say maybe we're the 10% that made it because there was a lot of, 
a lot of companies that really wanted to do something different, but it doesn't, it it takes a lot of determination and to make it past the seven year kind of mark. Um, so congrats guys for, um, it's not over yet, but, but, uh, it's fun to be up here. I want to see if we can roll through this a little bit quicker on this one. Um, cause there's a lot I want us to get through and talk about and open things up to the, for the, to the audience for questions. But so I'm both going to say, maybe this is tricky, maybe it's not, but let's, let's see how succinct this goes. I'd love to hear each of you talk about what you in your own manufacturing processes, facilities, et cetera, can each of you say or identify what is the single most difficult thing about constructing skis? Tumas. Cores. Cores are, it's a natural product. It's, there's variation. Like we can engineer the crap out of a ski and you have a known modulus, you have fibers, you have, we just buy all of our materials from aerospace, super high end materials. And you got to deal with a natural product of wood that has moisture and you're machining it and the tight tolerances to make a good ski great you need to be within ten thousandths of an inch in thickness to make the right profile that you want for your flex profile and to do that consistently in a manufacturing process um that's that's where you win or lose anybody else yeah i'd say uh consistency in everything uh your processes your materials and your workforce, you know, the crew that's that's actually doing the hard work. Having consistency consistency there is is critical. And so you're you're constantly working on that. Yeah, um, I'm definitely gonna echo what both of you just mentioned with consistency and specifically cores. Um, as Tomas mentioned, it is an organic. It's the only organic in the ski. Everything else is manufactured. You've got composites, you've got plastic, metal, um, you know, epoxy, resin, all this good stuff, and it's, that's all very static it, for the most part. There's certainly some loops that are going to get thrown uh, at you from time to time, but cores are unique, and those things can adjust, you know, the flex, the camber, um, all kinds of different attributes that you're really trying to nail down. And when you're building a custom ski, that can be especially difficult um, just because you're changing a lot of parameters every single time. And so in our case, having cores that we build in-house and having just measuring them out, engineering the heck out of them, and just having that unexpected organic reaction, it's like, it's really frustrating. It's not necessarily making the ski worse, but it may look a little different. <laughs> and that's not good. You agree? I agree. And I would like to tell that for like, during the last two years, we had so many problems, like different problems than constructing a ski. So it was challenging for everybody. And I think that for, for Majesty, it's important that, like I said earlier, we don't do like big steps, like big changes, because then, then you have to make a lot of you know, tests and uh, you need to see how the flex uh, distributes and everything is important. But if you make a, like, organic growth in terms of like building the ski. You can control everything. So, so it's the, the difficulties are not that big. If you want to change everything every season, I'm not talking about graphics, I'm not talking about yeah. flat. Like you want to have different shapes every year, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. So hmm. if, you, if you do it right, everything is like stable. Hmm. So if, if there's a lot of agreement on wood cores being the most complex part of this equation, though <laughs> there's staffing issues and all these other consistency across a lot of lines. I can see how that would change uh, from week to week. So why are we still using wood cores? <laughs> well, you, you kind of saw when, you know, back in the you know, 90s and yeah. early 2000s when that was not the status quo, right? Um, you know, foam and plastics and different types of materials that are more controllable were the solution. And it's just ultimately not the feel that you're looking for to get out of a ski. You're, you're, you're missing one major component is longevity. You know, a wood core is going to give you a really, really long life to a ski. 
uh, any kind of foam injected core, any kind of plastic, you know, mm -hmm. any kind of engineered material that's going into it. And trust me, I've tried a bunch. It just doesn't last and it doesn't react in the way that you want. Um, also, it's just the most natural way of skiing. You know, we really focus on making the wood core shine and be the most significant thing that you're feeling in that product. So we really minimize what we're doing from a composite standpoint. We really don't try to just hide a bunch of, you know, inconsistencies in our cores with, you know, different laminates that are going to hide that core not being strong enough or healthy enough. So I think that's kind of at least my perspective on that is you're, you're, you're missing that longevity component and two, you're just missing the feel, you know, and there's nothing else like it. Unfortunately, you can't 3D print wood. Maybe fortunately. Huh. Maybe fortunately. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree with Mike. I, we, we feel like at Meyer, the, uh, the wood is the heart and soul of the ski. Um, and a lot of people have tried different things. I mean, bottom line, if, if you don't have a wood core, you're probably skiing on a relatively, a lesser performance ski. Um, I'm old enough, I don't know how many people in here are, to, to have skied on the Hexel and the Honeycomb way back when. There's probably a few of you in here that might be older than me or as old. But, uh, you know, and it was awesome. It was so fun. But it didn't last that long, right? The core just didn't last that long. I mean, no one wants to ski on a ski that's just a slider, that's a dead slider. You want it to have life, and you want it to have that life for a long time, right? Um, you want it to spring you from turn to turn. You want to have fun on it. And that's why we use a transparent, you know, top sheet. We don't make a ski where you can't actually see some of the wood core. You see graphics, but you see a lot of the wood core. And that's, you know, our kind of unique look and feel. We're proud of the wood core. We put it front and center. I've had, you know, a lot of smart people come look at it and say, uh, I can see, I'm looking for, you know, gaps in the, uh, oh, actually, I don't see any of that. I mean, so you have to have good workmanship when you do that. But the, the wood core, at least so far, I don't think anyone has found a, a better replacement for a wood core ski. Uh, that's, that's what you need. Well, to your point in regards to the Hexel, um, we build a, really long straight ski called the TurnTech 201 Pro. And I reverse engineered a bunch of old straight skis. And guess what? I cut apart some old hexels. And that core came out in pieces. Yeah. You know, and sure, just time is going to beat those down, but skiing is as well. Tumas, you might have some thoughts on this. I, yeah. I, <clears throat> I mean, we do things differently. Um, with uh, carbon fiber facings are really hard to deal with. We need that core to do something completely different than a standard core which th that core is adding a lot of feel to a ski and there's that really classic feel there um we need that core to be absorbing energy and not providing life um i just got some results this morning from a, a ferry all up in canada uh, we're doing fatigue testing and they've gone about a hundred thousand cycles that the when you your facings are taking more of that strain and the core a natural wood product is less stressed so far it's about 2x the fatigue life in in overall um, bending stiffness. So, but point is like, can we do something different with the core? We can rely less on the core. Um, there there are the beauty and the beast of a natural product. It feels really good, um, but it's also um, we're trying to make the core a little bit more irrelevant because um, because the core breaks down, um, and that's what what we believe in for skis. So, crystal ball question. 20 years from now, you get to answer yes or no, that's it. 20 years from now, will most skis still have a wood core or predominantly wood core? Yes. No. Yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Ted? That wasn't one of the acceptable answers. It's Mike. true. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Yes. No. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. I've tried. I want to start some fights. Um, sure. Next question. We got one no. This one's for you, Tumas. <clears throat> 20 years from now, if wood cores are still being used as the 
dominant core material, is that more out of a legacy and heritage and consumer acceptance point of view? Oh, yes, of course I ski wood core skis. As opposed to new material, right, it's still the, the best source. Wood is still the best type of material to use for a core. So different, a little bit of a different question, right? Because think of mechanical watches, right? Mechanical watches are not as accurate as, as watches that have a cheap battery in them. There's other things going on that make them interesting and valued, valued and coveted. So we got their predictions about um, wood core, but the second one is, I guess, will it still be the leading material for cores? Janusz? I think so, because we wrap wood core with new materials and we wrap it with fiberglass, carbon, titano, whatever you can imagine. But, but the, 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 the heart of the ski is always something that can absorb energy. And I understand that DPS, they want to do things a little bit differently. But at the same time, if you combine carbon and the flexibility and the, 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 the power of wood core, you get like a boosted energy in a way. Hmm. So if we're going to change materials, I think if we're going to find something that is similar to wood core, <coughs> that might be it. But that's but what our guy's predicting down there. We're going to find it. We got 20 years. I, I think, <clears throat> I mean, planes aren't made out of wood anymore. They used to be. Um, and there's a lot of big industries have, that have, I, I, I don't know, there's so much that's changed in ski design in the last 20 years, the last 10 years, and there's new materials in the last five years. I don't want to be, I, I hope, I'm out of a job if we were just doing the same skis in 20 years, but um, <clears throat> there's also the standpoint, do you, remember when Solomon came out with like the Force 9, Force 8, and the, the rumor was there's styrofoam S's inside of that monocoque construction. There's nothing in there. And you're using the structure to create all that power. Well, it didn't have any dampness, but there's so many different ways of, of, of creating stability than just a, um, the centroid is where a lot of things are happening in a compression and tension. The middle is, needs to do something to, to balance some of the harmonics in, in this beam. Um, I don't know, there, there's, uh, let's, let's go back to K2 doing the K, you know, the, the piezoelectrics. There, there's uh, other, other ways of calming things down than a natural product in, in the middle of that sandwich. Yeah, so my dad skied till he was 96 years old. He uh, first made turns in the 30s. <clears throat> Uh, in New Hampshire, and uh, he skied on a wood ski back then. The funny thing is, we were having a night, long story, very short. I said, Dad, when did you first start making turns? He said, when I got bindings, because uh, it was just a little, you know, strap, and you just went straight. You didn't have much choice to be able to make turns. But, you know, wood was used for skis back then, and today it's still used. And it's interesting, we have done thousands of tours through our facility. We call them happy hour tours, kind of the end of the day when the production crew wraps up. People come in, have a libation, you know, go through the back and we, we show them everything, all the materials, all the steps that it takes to make skis. At least the way we do it, which is not completely dissimilar to really every brand in the world. Um, and one of the most common questions we get and this is to your point, uh, John, you, people ask, I didn't realize skis are still made out of wood. Mm -hmm. So we hear that more than anything because they typically can't see the wood, right? Everything's covered up. Um, oh, I thought it was, you know, I don't know, whatever, fiberglass or carbon fiber. And all that is part of at least our construction and, and most, most brands' construction. So uh, it's interesting. I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of amazing skis, high performance skis, have wood cores. Most everyone you ever see on TV skiing, I'm not saying all, but most everyone you ever see on TV skiing, the Olympics, X Games, their skis have a wood core. So I think it's going to be around a while. Though I think foams, I, I joke around at work, 
I use like don't use the F word, which is foam. And foam has a bad connotation with kid skis, um, squirt skis, injection skis, and and one of my favorite skis ever made. Um, well. It was a limited release from DPS, and it was a super, super high-end foam that was way more expensive than we thought. Um, and we and um, and it was commercially the bad thing to do. But it was the most damp ski I've ever skied. I still have it. Um, it's a, in a hundred under foot touring ski, and it was amazing. Um, it lacked a little bit on compressive strength, so a little bit to you know, it's, it's almost like a, a honeycomb. But we can solve that, you know, with other. There's a lot of additives going into epoxies, a lot of additives, nanoparticles, and things, different ways of creating alloys and and hybrids that can improve that. But I think the biggest limitation is cost. Um, there are the thing about wood is it's affordable, great properties, great strength, good sustainability, um, and it's uh, and like way better than metal, for instance, and so it has. It, it kind of fits a, a lot of different parts, but if cost wasn't an issue, there'd be wood would be gone. Yeah, I I, I agree with you completely. That was actually where I was going to go with this yeah. is just kind of the, the economics of it. Hmm. Um, you know, when you really want to start playing around and developing new materials, guess what? It is going to affect your bottom line drastically. And you can either pass that off on your client or just try to absorb it and, and you know, count it as R&D. But at the end of the day, I don't think there's enough stuff out available today in 2023 that's intriguing enough to anybody sitting up here that's really saying, yeah, we're going to pivot in 20 years to this. Um, that said, there's breakthroughs in all these different industries that have, you know, a lot of resources behind them that we're not aware of right now. And... In 20 years, maybe, but I think it's very unlikely in 20 years. 50 years, much more likely. Um, you can't be making a ski cost 10 grand. Yeah. Well, you can, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone needs to buy it. What's that? Someone needs to buy it. Yeah. Well, yeah. and is it just marginally better than right. a wood core ski? Right. Or is it really better? Right. You know, and is it, you know, what, what, what's the sustainability of that? What's what's that footprint on what it's actually doing to, to produce it. So I think in 20 years, I think absolutely wood cores are still gonna be status quo for high performance skis. Okay. It's just my thought. Switching gears. Um, we spent a lot of time yesterday talking a bit about how to review gear and what people might want to be looking for. We heard the term intuitive, we heard the term fun. And I think those are all great things. But there's a whole different component that gets talked about a lot less. Um, it, we don't talk about it that much on Blister. Um, skiers, maybe in the market for a new ski, um, are walking up to a wall of skis at a shop or a number of skis at a Blister Summit event. What are the best tips you could offer people in the market for skis just to be able to start to evaluate, ah, there is something I'm seeing that points to a well-constructed ski as opposed to something where not, not so good? Um, because it strikes me that the dominant thing is when you're walking around the summit today is all the different top sheets, right? And you start to notice tail shape differences, perhaps, rocker profile differences, perhaps. But from a construction point of view, are there things that the four of you look at and might offer up as advice, like pay attention to this or this other thing? Um, I guess I can lead us off unless you'd like to. Um, I think for me, the easiest way that I can bucket this out is I'm going to look at it from really a macro manufacturing and a micro manufacturing perspective. Uh, macro has got good finish no matter what. They've got a lot of years and a lot of resources to do that. So at the end of the day, they generally have very shiny, pretty top sheets and really good tunes that look good. Um, what you want to be looking for on the macro, at least from my perspective, Number one is consistency, and uh, you will notice a fair amount of uh, you know, inconsistent things if you have enough of a sample to look at. 
So if you go to a ski wall and you're lucky enough to have six pairs of the same pair of skis, set them up and look at them and look at all of them and see any kind of just like glaring inconsistencies that you can see right off the bat. Look at your camber profiles, kind of hand flex them a little bit. Stuff like that can really kind of show, you know, how consistent that brand is. Um, other things I'm looking for are just gaps. You know, you can shine up a gap with just a fill of epoxy. Um, but if you got, you know, a white plastic sidewall, ABS sidewall, moving into a tip fill and you got a centimeter gap just filled with a clear material, that's not a good sign. Um, gaps in your die cuts and your bases is another thing that stands out pretty well. Uh, gaps in between where your edges actually terminate into the base, if it's a full wrap or if it's an early term. Um, something like that is, is something that I'm usually looking for on the macro level. Another thing I generally do is I'll flex really any ski and I'll listen to it. And if I just hear it crackling over and over again, that's usually a pretty big red flag for me. Um, your composites should release and they should release really a few times through some heavy, hard flexing and then it should stop and you should really not hear it just cracking and cracking and cracking. If that just keeps doing that, I would, I would have pause on that product. Um, moving into the micro container, you know, these are smaller companies. Certainly I fall under that umbrella. Um, and we have less resources. We're generally doing a little bit more backwoods engineering to get this stuff finished in an economic way or an economical way rather. Um, so you just want to, you know, make sure the skis have a good clean finish, have a good solid tune, a good, you know, uh, consistent base grind. If you're seeing big tracking and, and fur and stuff in the base, that's correctable, but it's a pretty big red flag. Um, that's something that you definitely want to look for. And then really every other thing that I laid out in the macro com, uh, container kind of applies to the same, the same uh, way for the smaller brands. Um, but I think it's just a little bit more visible generally from the less informed eye on the, the micro side, just because generally those skis don't have that super shiny top sheet, don't have that super polished sidewall, don't have the access to the you know $5 million finish rooms that I heard Coop mentioned they just built out in uh, uh, the head factory recently. <laughs> Boy, do I wish I could afford that, but no, we can't. So, um, you know, those are some like just some really high level things that should stick out pretty quickly to you um, and things that I look for. Janusz, thoughts on this? Uh, this is a difficult question because we, we're trying to make the ski as perfect as it's possible. So we try to avoid all those things that we are discussing right now. And, and what I see on the market, like, all the brands they want to evolve in the way to make the product as as good as it gets, and I think that I, I, I will slightly change the topic, but but I think the cost con consumer is looking for like the perfect product. So we are talking about hand built skis, and um, and building ski is also interesting because you cannot reverse the pro uh, pro uh, process. Like when you build a bike, you can mount it unmounted you can do whatever you want with ski when you start there's no going back so mm -hmm. it's a process that has to be perfect on many mm -hmm. uh, stadiums so um, customers are looking for product that look like uh, jewelry so jewelry yeah yeah uh, so they look for every um, defect that they can find because they they think that this, as you put um, materials to some machine poof and ski is done and it should be perfect. But it's like, we have to do everything that's possible to make the ski perfect. But um, like, like you said, those small things always might happen. And, but at the end of the day, performance is something that is like, yeah. the most important. And um, <coughs> we have to remember that these are products that are made by hand. So they are unique. Mm -hmm. Ted or Tumas, before we open it up to questions? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, skis, a lot of people buy skis, hard to believe, I know, but based on the graphic, based on the top sheet, right? I do a show of hands, but we, we won't put you through that. Uh, so, and that's, you know, you can, com you can compare that to a lot of things where, you know, you're drawn in by what you see. It speaks to you. 
right? What you see is something that you're drawn to. And that's wonderful. I mean, my skis, we think we are, our skis look great. I'm sure everyone on this panel does. But to get down to, you know, what, what these guys are commenting on, really, if you want to get down to the nuts and bolts of it, turn the ski over, right? Let's start with the base of the skis and make sure that, uh, you know, the base of the skis feel nice and smooth. You know, there's a lot of brands out there, you know, from all over the world. They don't have to be, you know, big brands, small brands. It kind of doesn't matter. But, you know, is it smooth across the die cuts if they have die cuts in those skis? Or if there's a transition um, between different base materials, is that smooth? Because what's on the snow? What are you sliding on? The base. So people focus so much on the top sheet, right, the graphic, but I would encourage you all to spend a little more time focused on the base and the thickness of the base and the material of the base and the edges of the base, the thickness of the edges. Um, how many tunes are you going to get out of that ski? Is it smooth to start with? Or are you already starting with a problem that you can't tune away? Um, you know, these are the less sexy side of skiing, hmm. but are critical, important to having a ski with good longevity hmm. that skis well. Tumas, advice? One thing that I do admire about um, what you guys have been doing is some of the clear top sheets, that's really hard. You are just naked. You cannot hide anything. And, and, and there is a trend in, in some of the big guys. I, I, I think it's okay to call us boutique. We're, we're boutique builders. Um, and the big guys, um, they've gone more to a translucent, a little bit more, um, showing, showing a little bit more of the grain and, and technology and maybe some fibers and showing some of that wood. But, but um, for the most part, um, if you're building 500,000 pairs of skis and you have a clear top sheet, you might be scrapping um, 10,000 skis, maybe. And you can't do that. So being able to, like, top sheet's great for graphics. It's also great just to cover up a little bit what's, what's underneath there. And, and when, when you are clear, it's, you, it, it is what you got. But um, as a shopper, as a, as a skier, and you're going up to that wall, um, that, that graphics great that's it's going to look good um but i would focus on the closeout and the closeout is the only way you can really look into the heart of the ski maybe um, without a clear top sheet you can look at variations in cross-sectional thickness um, stiffness is to the third power if you'd have small changes in 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 your closeout that's going to change that that overall stiffness of that ski, maybe inadvertently and maybe in a place where you don't want it. Maybe it's going to be in a turn initiation or too stiff of a tail or, um, so look at that closeout and is that consistent along that whole ski? Um, and you might see some, some, some wavering. Um, and I don't, yeah, not to be redundant, but that, that base finish and the, the gaps, all those things um, are, are real critical in a, in a um, I mean, art, our skis are expensive. Um, we'd like to say they're, they're the lowest cost ski to operate per day because they're gonna last you 10 years, but our skis have to look perfect. So um, I'm amazed when I go to a wall and I, and I see a lot of top sheet dents and bases with nicks down them. And, and it's amazing in some high volume skis, what passes as A grade, we'd, we'd put those in the garbage. Hmm. Time to open this up for questions. Um, I think we have one here. So the question is different core types. Um, how do you think about what is the experience of working with something like a poplar core versus a maple core, et cetera? Mike? Um, so we work with a bunch of different wood styles, specifically poplar, maple, bamboo, and aspen. And we're really looking at what that species is, the density, how tight, you know, how tightly wound that cellular structure is in that piece of wood and how that's going to ultimately affect the ski. So in our case, we're really, really careful to add too many variables in what we're doing because that can really, really drastically change 
the overall personality of that ski. The wood core really does dictate the general feel and personality of it. So I'll try to keep this as quick as possible, but just from my experience, you use an Aspen core that's really lightweight. It's got a really open cellular structure, soft. Um, it works great for touring skis, but if you're hammering that on a resort ski, you know, a guy like me over six foot, over 200 pounds, it's going to be way too forgiving. It's not going to be nearly robust enough. You're not going to get any solid damping qualities out of it. You go on the far, far other end of it and you go full maple and just make a complete maple ski. You're going to get the exact opposite of that. You've got this really tightly wound cellular structure that's heavy, dense, super strong, and you're going to get this very, very aggressive, hard to ski ski. And it's going to be really fun to ski at very high paces. Not good for touring because it's heavy, but um, yeah, that's, that's kind of like the general way that we're looking at wood cores um, and just breaking it down to the species, really the density of that specific species, that specific board, and then where it really turns into the, the real rabbit hole is that organic that you can try to engineer it and try to find the consistency as you can or as much as you can across the board and you're going to get thrown for a loop from time to time actually quite often <laughs> thoughts on that um the type of wood core we use at majesty depends on the product we want to have if we want to have touring products we use very light wood core so we use um poplar poplar and ash and paulovnia for most of our touring skis we use paulovnia with with carbon fiber with fiberglass with um, textured plates but um like for me the best fun on skis you have like on poplar and ash combination because we use different kind of combination. Um, you need to make some sacrifices. Like when you want to have light touring gear, you cannot use that type of wood because it's too heavy. That's it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, another thing when when we are building skis, it's um, there are some limitations. You, if you build a ski, it cannot be too heavy if you build a touring ski. And um, of course, building a free ride ski, there's a lot more options because it, it might be heavier if you want to have like solid ski, but, but there are some like limitations uh, for us also, like touring ski is different than free ride ski. Free ride touring ski is another species. Like yeah. you, have to, you have to be a kind of, you know, alchemist yeah. to, 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 to bring the product with, uh, with, uh, with the um, ingredients that that will allow you to build the right product for the right user. Yep. Next question. Yep. So the question is, given the difficulty of working with wood cores and dialing those in, how much waste is there? Yep. I'll throw it out. Uh, you know, th there's not a ton mm -hmm. of waste. I mean, when you purchase the materials or the wood in this instance, you're specking the wood. Uh, it doesn't mean you get exactly what you ask for, but there's different grades of wood, right? So, you know, we, we go for, you know, a higher grade, a clean wood. So it doesn't have big loose knots. Uh, it's, uh, if there's knots, they're, they're small, tight knots. So I wouldn't say there's a lot of waste. There are some boards, you know, before you actually glue together a, a core block, uh, you know, there might be some pieces of wood that we take a pass on. Um, but I wouldn't say that there's a ton of waste uh, as far as wood goes. It, also, building skis in North America is, can be very expensive. Anything that ends up on the floor is wasteful. That's um, not from only a sustainability standpoint, but from cost. Um, our wood cores are actually, we're, we build two wood cores at a time, and it's a little bit more of additive manufacturing rather than subtractive. So um, the middle of the ski is always thicker. Um, and we have actually patents on this where we can build, we could have a, the lower part of the core. We have dissimilar materials um, side to side and vertically dissimilar materials will, will dampen and uh, cause different things uh, uh, dampen the ski. But, but you're actually able to pic picture a triangle or a pyramid. And so we can have less wood on top because you're going to be sheeting that wood away anyways. So just a small little detail of of anything we talk about wasteful that's wasteful is expensive and we don't want it in the uh, dumpster so the question is what are your own backgrounds uh in terms of construction building engineering say a word on that 
I could start. Just uh, uh, material science is a is a, cre a key component of building skis. My background's in plastics engineering with an emphasis in reinforced plastics or composites. So you have to um, understand both mechanical engineering and materials. A ski is exactly those two things combined. I'm a skier, uh, a lifelong skier. I am not an engineer by education, but thankfully we supplement our staff with some really smart guys that are engineers. Um, and in the end, this ski's got to be fun. It's got to make us all happy, our customers and our employees. Um, I'm also not an engineer by education. However, I grew up working for some medical grade injection molding plastics facility at a very young age and also did some carbon fiber and different composite replacement pieces for aerobatic and unmanned airplanes in a, in a very early age, uh, which has really translated quite well. And I ski a lot and have done so, so for a very long time. So I'm involved in sports industry and I've been working on different kind of sport products. And uh, I'm not an engineer, but I was doing like a lot of like board sports, um, like windsurfing, surfing, kite surfing, snowboarding, skiing, and all those things that we 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 see. Let's let's call it extreme sports. They have many things in common. So when we build skis, it's like it's very important to know the aerodynamics of of surfing, of uh, like snowboarding, of uh, you know um, kite surfing. It helps a lot because there are different, you know, different um, areas where you use the product. Um, but at the end, it's like all, all those sports are board sports. So you can pick the things that, that you know that will work and combine it into, let's say, free ride skis. And uh, there's a lot of talking about how, how skis are being surfy. And um, I was thinking about this while, while testing different products today. And it's like, if skis are surfy, it doesn't mean that they are not, like, they, there is no control. Mm -hmm. Because even when you surf, yeah. you, you just don't, you know, flip, rotate. You have to go on, on the track. So there are many similarities. And I think that the background that, that we have it's, uh, it's very important to, to create the product that will be significantly different and better than something that was in the past. Hmm. Next question. I'm going to paraphrase this one a bit. Skis have changed a bit since, say, the, we'll just tar home in on the, like, since the 80s and 90s. Give me succinctly the most significant element of skis that you think has changed? And I'll throw out, I guess, one possibility might be shape, one possibility might be materials. I don't know if you would offer something else, but if you had to sort of say, you know, categorically or broadly, the biggest development or advancements in skis that we have today versus 40 years ago is what? Um. I guess I can spearhead this one pretty quickly. For me, it's very clearly shape. Um, materials, if you really go back in time, are all pretty similar for a very long time. They've tried a lot of different things, and shapes didn't change much for a very, very, very long time. And then all of a sudden, there was side cut, and there was wide skis, and there was reverse side cut, and then the whole camber and reverse camber and rocker situation came into play. So that's shape in two ways. The physical shape of the ski, in the shape of it, how it's sitting in the snow. Everybody Are, agree with that? Nope. Okay. Good. <clears throat> nice. Just to add controversy, but <laughs> I, I think a reason that shapes have come so far is because of material changes. We could not have done a ski in the early 80s that was fat enough um, because of the modulus, and you, you would just twist off, like, um, it, it would be an... an completely unskiable ski if we just use triax glass unidirectional fiber because as things as moments get bigger um it's a it's all about ei in a small little box you can control your torsional stiffness when it's getting wider there's a lot more load happening there and the 
geometries have come so far, but I don't think we could have done it independent of material properties. So you're saying actually you think, I mean, I think though Mike's right. Historically, it was shapes. It was first shapes and then the materials let us do better. It, you're not actually claiming historically it was material advancements that then enabled the shift in shapes, are you? I mean, I think like the Atomic Powder Plus, they, you couldn't go that wide without changing some of your materials. You couldn't, okay. I mean, the the noodle or, you know, there, there, were, there were some wider shapes that were just noodles. Yeah. Um, and so they went hand in hand. So we could go wider when we changed some of the um, glass from E-glass to S-glass. To, to, to be a unifier here, they're, <laughs> no. they're both spot on. And uh, I agree with them both. I. I, I mean, I grew up when, when you skied, you picked your length. It was, yeah. you're standing up as high as you could reach yeah. and maybe a little bit higher to show that, you know, <clears throat> you skied a longer ski. If you, if you were six foot and you didn't ski 210 or longer, you were dismissed as a skier. <laughs> Where I grew up skiing anyhow. Um, and so I still am talking people out of, they'll come into the shop and they're like, yeah, I'm looking for like a 200 centimeter ski, and they're like 5'10". I'm like, yeah, when's the last time you bought a pair of skis, mm -hmm. you know? Things have changed. So materials and shapes, I mean, all the above has contributed to where we are today, which makes a much more skiable ski and a much more enjoyable experience for new people coming into the sport. And I think that the most important thing is change of perception because for many years people thought that ski has to look like this and if it is a rocker ski it will yeah. not be let's say mm -hmm. stable yeah. so all those small things that we change every season they they make the the ski much better than it was but we have to change our thinking of the product that's mm -hmm. that's the that's the key here mm -hmm. Well, listen, thank you. I, I think that was great. And I think some of the specific thoughts about what we might be looking for in skis is pretty helpful. So I really appreciate the perspectives. And uh, now let's just go see, ski some more stuff. Okay? Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.